All right, let's get this party rolling. Uh, my name is John Butler, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on patched and thread locking for fasteners. Now, already a heavy finger. Let's go back here. Apologize for that. All righty, so today is our thread patch locking webinar and I wanted to go over the content of what we're discussing today. Uh, first, we'll have a introduction of the Olander company. As I stated a little earlier, for those who just joined us, uh, if you scroll to your, your mouse to the top or to the bottom, and we'll have a Q&A session. So enter in any questions that you might have, and we will we'll, uh, address those questions uh, towards the end of the webinar. We'll also have a poll uh, today. There'll be three questions. Uh, there's there's no uh, right or wrongs. This is a training session, so um, just answer what you feel is the best answer for the question, and we'll review those as well. Uh, we'll go over the founding principles of Olander. Uh, we'll get into the thread profile, and how that relates to thread locking, and also uh, clamp load and how that relates to any vibration. We'll have the introduction of patch products and microsphere thread locking. And we'll dive into the, those two uh, patch products as well and microspheres, those two individual parts. We also have a 10 minute video that we've recorded. And then we'll go through to the uh, answer any of the questions that you have and also our closing remarks. So let's get going here. So we are known as the Olander family of companies. And we do have three different locations all on the West Coast. We do service 45 different countries and all states in the Union. Uh, Sunnyvale, California, Rancho Cordova, California, and Woodenville, Washington, where my friend Doug Miracle. Doug, introduce yourself. Good morning. Yes, I'm Doug Miracle. I'm the Territory Sales Manager up here in Woodenville, Washington. The Pacific Northwest. So it's known as the Olander Company, uh, Olander Fasteners, and the Olander Corporation. All of us are known as the Olander family of companies. My name is John Butler. I am a certified fastener specialist. Uh, means I've taken about a week full of training and answered uh, questions to pass the test. And I've had 27 years in the fastener industry. I am the business development manager for the Olander family of companies. Uh, my email address, phone number, and also my Twitter handle. We'll get into the poll questions first. And if you go ahead and answer the best uh, of your knowledge, what you believe to be the correct answer, we would appreciate it. This is interactive. So uh, without you participating, uh, uh, I don't have anything to discuss. So, so please make sure that you, you join us here. So the first question is, does the color of a nylon patch identify different prevailing torque performances? Either no, the color doesn't matter, they're all the same. Yes, color identifies the type of nylon being applied, or you're unsure. Second one is, does thermal cycling require different chemical solutions for thread locking? No, just make sure you use a heavy patch, or yes, different materials are designed for different temps, or unsure what thermal cycling is. And I can tell you it's not uh, uh, a hot uh, bicycle ride. Um, number three is our, our uh, mechanical locking fasteners such as disc lock washers or split lock washers superior to patch or microsphere product. It's either yes, mechanical solutions are far superior to chemical. No, vibration and heat are an issue for mechanical fasteners or unsure if there's a difference. Uh, other than costs. So if you will uh, go ahead and, and pick the answer that you believe to be correct, uh, we would appreciate that and we'll go over these toward the end. So uh, while you're doing this, I'll talk a little bit about myself. I've been in the industry for 27 years. I came to Olander about seven years ago. Uh, so I guess I'm about uh, 28 years in now. I came from the Midwest out in Wisconsin where I worked for a fastener distributor uh, out there. 
and uh, let's go ahead and uh, hopefully you've uh, completed all those and we'll get on with the presentation. So who is Olander? Uh, we were founded on service. Uh, Philip Olander was a World War II hero. Uh, Phil was an engineer in the United States Army Air Corps. And his B-7 bomber was shot down over Germany and he became a prisoner of war in May of 1994. Um, during his uh, time in, in the service, uh, Phil always had an issue with trying to uh, get fasteners and parts for the airplanes. And that was his inspiration to starting uh, the business when he came back home to start a, a fastener company. And his theory was always that you can't sell out an empty box. And, and many people talk about that. Uh, you know, you, you have long lead times. Uh, you don't have in, in any inventory. It's hard to sell. So Olander has plenty of inventory between our different locations. We have over $8 million worth of inventory. So there's a lot of parts that we do have, a um, lot of different uh, industrial hardware, uh, adhesives, washers, bolts, screws, but uh, also tools as well, and many other items. So uh, we have a vast a variety of, of inventory. So Doug, if you can go through the profile for me. Yeah, well, what we have here is a typical thread profile. And you see several terms on there. You see the thread flanks. Uh, you see thread angle. Uh, you see the root and the crest, the pitch. That's the number of threads per inch. And then you have the helix angle there. Uh, also, you have major and minor diameter and another one called pitch diameter that falls right in between there. Now, the pitch diameter is very important. That's like the contact point between the mating threads. It's sort of a theoretical point. Um, and that is where the threads actually engage with the mating thread. Now, all of this is governed by thread specs. Uh, you see UNF, UNC, NPT, metric. These are all specs. And the way the history goes is back in 1770, the first screw machine lathes showed up in England. And at that point, machine shops began making threaded fasteners. But there was no spec, and so at one point, there was probably about 70-some different thread pitches being used. And a, a gentleman um, by the name of Mr. Whitworth looked at that and said, we need to standardize this. It's getting out of control. I, I can tell you it would have made our business absolutely impossible. So he proposed a 55-degree thread angle with rounded roots and crests, and that became the standard that was used in 1841. Now, at the same time in the United States, uh, there was another gentleman named William Sellers, and in 1864, he proposed a 60 degree thread angle with sharp roots and crests. And what that did is that made it easier to produce. Uh, and so fast forwarding a little bit, to 1948 when they needed to have one standard. Um, they got together and they looked at it. It was decided to go with the seller's model simply because it was, it was cheaper to produce and easier. And so that became the UNF, UNC, NPT, and this is what we work with today. Uh, the thread pitch is really important to the locking mechanism because the characteristics that are defined here uh, govern the, the contact points and everything, but there's also something called clearance, and the specs call out that clearance. It's usually built into the male thread, and that becomes very important in, our, uh, in keeping fasteners tight. So the one thing you, you mentioned about uh, the thread pitch, uh, amount of threads per inch, that, that's for uh, coarse fine and NPT. Uh, metric, of course, it's the actual measurement from the crest of one thread to another in, in metric fasteners, okay? Yes, correct, absolutely. So in this slide, we see a depiction of that clearance. Uh, that space, the white space in between there, that is the clearance. That's what allows us to 
assemble a fastener and disassemble it. Without that, we wouldn't be able to move the parts relative to each other. However, it's also the very thing that gives rise to movement under vibration, and we'll look at that some more in a minute. <clears throat> All right, what we have here is we have a depiction of a, a standard bolted joint. And what we do here is we're, we're applying a rotational torque. A fastener is nothing more than a, a lever wound around an axis. So when we put that into a threaded hole or we put a nut on it, we're leveraging one against the other. We're putting the bolt into tension. And what that's doing is producing what we call clamp force. And that is the integrity of the joint. Now, in engineering, when we design a bolted joint, they're going to design it to what we call proof load. Proof load is 80%. That's basically 80% of the tensile strength of that bolt. Uh, beyond that, we begin to deform the bolt itself permanently. But at 80%, we have applied the maximum amount of, of force or clamp load to that joint. The, the key becomes now, as we move on in the presentation, is to keep that clamp force in place. So one of the things I like about this image is uh, they're turning the nut and a lot of people don't know that you should always turn the nut and not turn the bolt. Uh, the only time you turn a screw is if it's a threaded hole. Uh, if there's a nut on the other side, you always uh, turn the nut. And the reason being is the friction from the hole itself and underneath the flange of the bolt. So you always make sure to turn the nut itself, okay? Absolutely, yes. And what we have here in this slide now, we talked about the pitch angle uh, and, or the helix angle, excuse me. Um, and that's a depiction of that helix angle and the pitch line that we spoke of. So any sideways movement between the fasteners, any movement in that clearance area is going to exhibit itself in a rotational motion downward. Uh, just like you see there, you see the little arrows indicating a sideways vibration. Uh, on the one below there, you see something. This would be like heat cycling. We have axial loading. Uh, and what's happening there is, is it's going through heat cycles. The bolt is stretching and contracting very small amount. But nonetheless, when that happens, it can relieve some of that friction at the pitch line. And that will, uh, again, allow that rotational loosening to happen. It's in the picture there, you see that if you look at the relative size of the arrows, it's much easier to pull something downhill than to push it uphill. And so anytime we have any vibration or heat cycling, the motion is always downhill uh, and then we lose the clamp load on the joint. Uh, now the typical bolt, bolted joint, the interface between the nut and the bolt or the screw and the parent material, there's only about 15% true metal to metal contact there. 85% uh, of that is empty space because of the clearance. And, and this is what we have to address with, with a patch or with any locking mechanism to do something to, uh, to take care of that space and eliminate the movement. Yeah, things want to come apart and that's what we're talking about. And that's how, this is how we're going to uh, take care of that. Uh, here we see a picture of a patched product here. So this could be your screws. Uh, the patch has been applied. It's a 6-6 nylon compound. This is not an adhesive. It's just simply a nylon material that is deposited. It comes in a powder form and it's uh, put on with an applicator there. The bolts are heated using induction heat. And once the powder hits the bolt, it then uh, adheres itself. And you'll notice some characteristic things here. You notice the first three threads, those are generally left clean so that you can start the fastener into the hole. And then we can adjust or, or we can request that that patch be moved up or down or increased or decreased in size, depending upon what the interface is going to be. So wherever you need to have that locking, we can place the patch appropriately. <clears throat> um, the, this meets the IFI-124 uh, or the, the IF-524, 
and, and that's be for the metric. And those are basically good. A patch is uh, unlike many other locking mechanisms that we have. Uh, patch is reusable. Uh, up to five cycles is what the spec calls for. That's what you see there on the slide. It's a uh, it's a dry patch. So once it's uh, um, um, applied to the bolt itself, and uh, then it's shipped off to us, and, and we send it out. Um, we discussed yesterday. There's no um, uh, uh, shelf life on this. It uh, can be used forever. <laughs> So now in this slide, we see sort of a cutaway, a section view of what's going on inside that bolted joint. Uh, a couple of things you'll notice on the one side, very little material. Uh, on the back side, uh, we have more material. The, the one side is the load side. And as we said earlier, when, when the, the joint is loaded, there's space between or behind that thread. And that's what we need to fill. And what that does is that now stops any movement uh, back and forth between those mating parts. And, and when we stop any movement, we don't activate that downward motion. We don't get the rotational loosening. And so this, this just shows how the, this would uh, eliminate the effects of vibration. Yeah, it's a great image. For those that haven't seen a cutaway, um, if both of the, or all the uh, flats here were were up against uh, the mating thread, it would be so hard to thread in a bolt that, that it would, would not happen. So there's always going to be, as Doug stated, that clearance. And, and uh, what the patch does is it pushes the fastener to the other side and uh, causes friction. And that friction uh, is what keeps it in place. That's right. Yeah, a patch really is a mechanical lock. Uh, you see another example here where we've actually machined the screw and put an insert in here. Uh, and what that does, it functions the same way as a patch does. Uh, exactly as John said, it forces the bolt to one side. So the side opposite of the patch or the strip or pellet, uh, you're increasing the friction and the amount of contact area on that side. However, the patch or the strip is taking up that space on the backside to eliminate any motion, uh, any movement between the two. Uh, and you have, uh, this meets all of the, the specs uh, listed there. Um, and what you see there, that's a strip. Uh, pellet, you just picture a, a drilled round hole with a round insert there. Now they can do 100, 360 degree as well. Uh, and these are good for for temperatures up to about 500 if we use the high temp version. And now we get to the million dollar question. What is the cost of a patch? We've talked about what it does and how it's so good. Uh, now we're concerned with what's it gonna cost me? Well, maybe the best answer to that is what does it cost us if we don't do it? Uh, the cost of failure. Uh, product returns, warranty issues, uh, heaven forbid, catastrophic failure. Uh, one of the benefits of a patch is it's already on the fastener. So in the assembly process, you can't forget to put it on. Uh, you also have the possibility if you're doing a lot of uh, assembly and you need high quantities, that helps to bring the price of the patch down. Uh, you also eliminate other locking hardware. And we see the nylock nut and we see the uh, spring lock washer there. These are ways to retain that, that clamp load. However, uh, in the case of the nylock nut, that is not reusable, at least not with any good conscience. Uh, once you put it on and the threads have cut their, their way into that nylon, you've really lost most of the retention value of that nut. Um, in this case of a spring lock washer, these are good uh, for axial loading because they keep that joint in tension. Uh, however, they really don't address the sideways movement between the threads. Uh, and so while they are good for some aspects of locking, uh, I feel like the patch uh, or pellet or strip or whatever is probably a superior approach 
given um, the effects of vibration. But as far as the cost, if you eliminate these pieces of hardware, that's less things on your bill of materials, less cost, uh, and, and those become benefits as well. And, and looking at the Loctite, Doug, so um, the people out in the uh, plant that are applying the Loctite can over apply it or under apply it. And, and also you have cleanup uh, that, that's a problem as well. And all of those are eliminated uh, when you're using a nylon patch. Yeah, that is absolutely correct. Sometimes sensitive electronics and everything, uh, too much Loctite can get into there and really cause some, some issues. So now we'll get into microspheres and, and microspheres basically is an adhesive. Okay, whereas a nylon patch is, is forcing the, the bolt to the one side, this is actually locking it into place. And there's three different types. They have an epoxy, which is the most popular, uh, an acrylic, and also what they call a TA. So, so what is a microsphere? Um, these are actually chemicals that um, are introduced together. It's a resin and a catalyst, and it's sprayed onto the bolt but they're not mixed together until you go ahead and thread in the fastener itself. And that's where you get the chemical uh, interaction between, between the resin and the catalyst. Uh, this has a very low on torque. So that means when you're threading it in, you're able to thread it in rather easily. Um, the, the thicker, like a, a heavy nylon patch is more difficult with higher on torque, uh, but it has great locking performance and it uh, initial setup is it within four hours and total cure rate is in 72 hours. This does have a two year shelf life on it. So you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, parts going bad uh, within two years, um, you should use the product. Uh, this does resist chemicals. It's very popular in the auto industry, whether it's the Ford spec, GM, Hyundai, Kia, they all have different specifications, but this meets all of those specifications and surpasses the IFI standards that we talked about earlier uh, for locking fasteners. This is another new one that uh, has come out and it is for the electronics industry. It's called the Electrolock. And uh, within the electronics industry, they want to have a low halogen outgassing. So this is less than 500 parts per million. So it's designed specifically for the electronics industry and for very, very small fasteners where it's a M1.6, an M2, a 256 or odd size screws. Yeah, we can, we can do very small screws. Um, it also has a low on torque and uh, a higher locking performance. And as I stated, it's designed for smaller fasteners. Now, along with the, uh, this is a microsphere type uh, application. It does have the four hours uh, for initial setup and 72 hours. The two year life cycle, or I should say two year, um, oh, shelf life. There we go, two year shelf life. It also resists the chemicals and it also surpasses those DIN standards that we talked about, the uh, MS specifications that we talked about earlier. I'm gonna get into a little video for you. Hi everybody, thank you for joining us again today for another installment of the Olander Fastener Minute. My name is John Butler. I'm the Director of New Business Development for the Olander Company, and I'm joined here today by Doug Miracle. Doug, you want to tell a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm the Territory Sales Manager for the Woodenville location of Olander up in Washington State. And uh, we do a lot of business with a lot of companies that need to secure their fasteners from coming loose so they don't have uh, warranty issues and things coming back. So we're here to talk about, about thread locking mechanisms and how they work. That's awesome, Doug. That's correct. So today we're going to talk about patching. Okay, so it's a thread patch. So what is a patch, Doug? Well, a patch can be a couple of different things. These bolts here that you see have a micro-encapsulated epoxy patch. 
And that is basically a material that is, is impregnated with capsules of resin and catalyst. Uh, when you put that in, those capsules rupture and they form an epoxy adhesive. Uh, there's also a nylon 6-6 patch, which we more properly refer to as a patch, uh, that is a mechanical lock. It's a little different. What it does is it puts a, a glob of plastic on one side that forces the fastener to the opposite side, increasing the friction on that side. And this causes the, the faster to be locked in place and no movement allowed between the mating parts. The microencapsulated epoxies are a little different. What they do is they actually form an epoxy adhesive in there that also expands and it fills that space as well. So when you stop the movement between the threads, you stop the rotation and that's what locks the fastener in place. Okay. So there are also uh, other types of microspheres that uh, besides the epoxy that have different um, chemicals for different uh, applications. So these do meet a lot of the GM, Ford, Hyundai, DIN, and IFI specifications for patch or for micro-encapsulated thread locking on fasteners. So uh, the big difference on what we're doing today is we're talking about two different aspects, more towards the patch aspect. Now a patch is just, as Doug said, uh, a nylon that is sprayed on the threads to push it to one side. Um, now, with the different colors that we have, you can um, have different thread sizes um, made in different colors of nylon in order to keep them uh, separate. You don't want to have different screws mixed up in your application. So they are able to do, as what you see here, we have a red patch, we have a blue patch, but we're also able to do many other colors, including yellow. So we also are able to do nuts as well as the bolts here today, which is what we're showing you. So the way that they spray, um, they apply the patch to the fastener. So you want to go a little bit, talk a little bit about that, Doug, where the location is of the patch? Sure. Uh, if you notice on the, on the fastener, the first three threads will always be left bare. That's so that you can start the fastener into the, the mating part. Once you start that, you begin to reach the patch, and this is where you have what we call prevailing torques. It's going to fight you a little bit going in, but that's what's going to lock it in place from not coming out. And call that the on torque. Correct. Okay. So what is the difference between uses with a, a nylon patch versus a microsphere? Can they both be used over again? Uh, no, I mean, one cannot. The microencapsulated epoxy, once it's used, you need to remove the faster, completely clean it off, and then reinstall it. On a patch, yes, you can use that, I think they say up to 15 times. Uh, mind you, there will be some degradation in the holding power as you move out further and further. But the answer to that is yes, you can reuse it. So after each application where you reinstall it, you're going to lose a little, le little more of the locking power of what the patch will provide you, and that's what you meant. Mm -hmm. So your on torque and vibration is reduced out of each time that you put the fastener in place. That's correct. Okay. So why would I use a, a microencapsulated part versus a nylon patch? I think a microencapsulated part leans more to the smaller fasteners. We have very fine threads, and you're possibly using very small electric tools to install, maybe in very tiny electronics, things like that. And what, what it does is it lessens the amount of torque necessary to drive the fastener in. And so it's only going to activate once the fastener is in place and that epoxy is actually mixed and released in there. Uh, you could use a patch, but uh, you might run into trouble with your drive systems. Uh, the drive system may not be robust enough to handle that additional on torque. There is an option also of a light patch that can sometimes mitigate those situations as well. So as you see here, we have some very tiny screws from a metric 1.6 up to 3A16 bolts. Um, there is no real limit to what size you can do. Um, it, the costs vary, of course, but um, how hard it is to <laughs> apply the patch or the microspheres to the part itself. It can go on nuts, it can go on bolts, and this doesn't have to just be a fastener. This can also be put on NPT, pipe yes, threads, and things of that nature. So um, what you want to do is reach out to Olander and let us help you suggest what is the best fastener for your application. We've been in business since 1962, 
We have three locations, two in California and one in Woodville, Washington, where Doug is. So we're happy to reach out and help you with your applications. You can find us on the web at olander.com. Also, find us on YouTube as well. Doug, I want to thank you for being here today. Thank you, John. Any other things you want to talk about um, as far as the patch and the um, microspheres? No, just one quick thing I, I was going to mention. I know if you guys think the way I do, often I worry about whether a patch or, in this case, a micro-encapsulated epoxy really works because once it's in, it's invisible. We tend to put a lot of faith in things like lock washers and lock nets, but I'm here to tell you that they absolutely do work. Thank you. Fantastic, Doug. I appreciate putting that in there, but obviously I forgot about talking about that, so thank you very much. Well, um, reach out to us at olander.com, and thank you for joining us today. All righty. Thanks for uh, going through that. And it uh, looks like we do have a question here that we want to get answered. Uh, so, Doug, I'll, I'll read it off. Um, hello, guys. I'm a member of the team developing high-voltage distribution units for PHE vehicles located in Europe. During development of the product series of validation tests, we noticed that smaller threads, smaller than M5 generally, are less uh, sensitive to vibration. Why is that? Does their lower inertia maybe? Uh, we also noticed that the uh, suppliers in Europe does not uh, patch locks for screws smaller than M5. Is this connected to its high resistance to vibration? Great question. Yeah, good question. Um, I'm going to suggest a theory. I don't know this for a fact, but I'm going to say that it, it could be due to the fact that the helix angle is lesser with that fine pitch. So it would be sort of like uh, pulling a load down a steep hill versus a not so steep hill. Uh, that may be a possible explanation. I would have to defer to someone more authoritative for a real answer. Sure, and, and we do have the uh, Electrolock, which is uh, designed specifically for very, very small screws. But uh, we'll, um, if you'll go ahead and um, email us, and your name is Paul Lip, we'll go ahead and uh, reply to you uh, with some other answers as well. Thank you very much for sharing that uh, question with us. And question. also go ahead and get into the poll questions that we had earlier. All right, so does the color of a nylon patch identify different prevailing torque performance? Most people said yes, the color identifies the type of nylon being applied. Well, um, there are different manufacturers and, and some of the mil spec call outs, if it's a mil spec part, it will call out a blue patch for um, nylon. Um, and then if it has a call out for a yellow patch, that's a ND Industries. But the actual colors themselves do not really make a difference. There are different chemicals that uh, come in different colors, like high temp is usually a red color, uh, so that it's identified that way. But the actual color itself um, is irrelevant to the fastener unless it's a mil spec part. So we can do many different colors if, uh, like I said before, we can also put colors on the head of the fastener itself. So after it's already installed, you could identify what that fastener was for or what size it is um, by the color. So we can actually take nylon and put it on the head of the uh, bolt as well. We would never want to do that to a screw that would have like a Phillips recess. Uh, or a slotted drive or something like that, because we wouldn't want to fill in any of that drive system. The second is, does thermal cycling require different chemical solutions for thread locking? And overwhelmingly, people said, yes, different materials are designed for different temps. That, that is correct. Um, and, and we talk about unsure what uh, uh, thermal cycling is. So thermal cycling is the heating and cooling that happens in different environments. Uh, you could uh, imagine, uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, the uh, um, alternative energy 
that we have in the solar fields in the desert that gets hot and cold. Um, and that's what thermal cycling is. So there are different chemical solutions uh, for, for thread locking and, and we can uh, take care of that with you. Uh, depending upon what application you have, we will make suggestions as to what the uh, appropriate solution would be for you. And third one is our chemicals uh, mechanical locking fasteners such as disc lock washers or split lock washers superior to patch or microsphere. And most said no, the vibration and heat are an issue for mechanical fasteners. And, and that is correct. So when we look at vibration, it has a, an adverse effect on a bolted joint. If you do not have any vibration at all, when you torque a bolt to its uh, designed uh, uh, fa um, installation torque, it will stretch that bolt and stay in place. It's the vibration and then the heat cycling that, or thermal cycling that causes a uh, fastener to come loose. Doug had put the graphic uh, earlier there about the ascent and descent. Uh, it's always easier to uh, unscrew a fastener than it is to uh, tighten it to the clamp load that's necessary. So very good. Thank you for the interaction for that. We do appreciate that. So then we'll get into uh, some of the uh, applications that we have. Doug, you had a very interesting application for medical device. Can you speak about that? Sure. Yeah, it was a, um, a very small pin, 440 pin, that was being put into a brass insert, which was over molded with rubber. Uh, so we had some real challenges as far as the amount of on torque we were able to use. If it was too great, it would spin within that rubber over molded part. Uh, yet we needed to have good retention value and we needed to have electrical conductivity as well. So using a patch, as I explained before, we, we put the patch on there, that forces the fastener to one side of the hole, so we still have good contact there. And then we were able to engineer that patch, a light patch, if you will, uh, very finitely. Uh, if you can imagine on a 440 thread, uh, we put a patch on there that we could control plus or minus one inch pound. Now, that's not a lot. That's a very narrow band, but we had to have maximum off torque with minimum on torque and, and control that within one inch pound. Now this was a piece of, of life critical medical equipment uh, that if that contact is not made, the desired result does not happen. Uh, it had been a chronic problem for the manufacturer for years. Uh, so we were able to solve that with a patch. Okay, another um, the auto industry, uh, most of the fasteners that are in there have uh, some type of patch on them as well. And, and that's where all of the uh, specifications are for the auto industry. They just do not want things to come apart. Um, another application that we'll speak about is the alternative energy. And this was the solar field that was in Nevada. And you can imagine the desert, it gets rather hot during the day and rather cold at night. And they had these, what they call trackers. And what these solar panels do is they track the sun as it comes across the sky and, or as the earth turns, I should say. And um, this uh, is the best way to get the most energy out of the, the solar panels. So the problem was, is that, as I stated, thermal cycling, the heating and cooling of the day, they were having issues with the uh, fasteners losing their clamp load and coming apart. So, you know, that causes an issue. So one of our manufacturers uh, went out, saw the application, and they solved that with a locking fastener as we had talked about uh, in, in our uh, presentation today. So um, looking at that, there's great ways to uh, hold parts together, whether it's aerospace, electronics, robotics, uh, contact us and we can help you out. Now, I did see that a lot of you are, are using the chat, so I'll get to that in a second. We also have another question and answer here. Uh, Gregory Grable, uh, are any of the patches compatible with high vacuum environment? 
So I'll speak to that. Um, we, we look at, at the different um, materials that are um, available and what the different act, um, applications are. So whether it's a cryogenic uh, vacuum, uh, we, we have different um, solutions for you. Um, Gregory, if you can go ahead and send us an email, we can get into what type of an environment that is. I, 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 uh, it's further in depth. Uh, than what we have right here that we'll get into. Want to make sure we get you the proper um, answers and solutions for you. Uh, the problem there, of course, as you know, is probably the outgassing of the part itself. Um, second one, Doug, is uh, does nylon or microsphere coatings increase removal torque uh, significantly? So the off torque. Yes, it would, because you do have an adhesive bond that's being formed uh, so you're going to have to overcome that bond, um, and that now that would be uh, a little bit different with a nylon patch. But uh, as we explained before, with the adhesive, uh, you've actually formed a molecular bond there in some cases, or an epoxy bond. So to break that is going to take more. It's not going to damage the fastener. Uh, unless, of course, we might be talking something like red Loctite or something like that where you need to heat it. Uh, but it was a micro-encapsulated epoxy. Uh, you're not going to damage the fastener. But yes, it is going to take additional torque to, to remove it. Excellent. Thank you, Doug. So uh, I appreciate the uh, um, engagement here. Let's go through and we'll go through the chat. Um, Let's take a look here. And great technical content. Thank you very much. Uh, exceptional content. Well presented. Thank you. Um, Doug, are any of these patches compatible? Oh, and that one we already talked about. And uh, we'll get back with uh, Gregory on that. This is Greg, Q and answer. All righty. Q and A, we took care of that. Great idea to have the poll. Large amount of unsure on question three was uh, illuminating the reinforced to need to continue to educate customers on value of patched products. That's why we want to do this. Uh, you know, it, this is faster training, and this is for everybody in the faster industry or anybody that is design or engineers um, getting the most information you can. And that's what we do at Olander. We provide, um, you know, 62 years of faster knowledge. Um, that's how long the company's been in business. Of course, we have more knowledge than that because some of our employees have been here over 30 years. Uh, I have 27 years of experience in the faster industry. It doesn't mean we know it all, but it means we know how to get you the answers. And that's why I have a certified fastener specialist. Uh, designation it means I've taken the test. I know where to go get your answers for you and we'll be able to uh, um, answer those one at a time. So please make sure you email us and I'll give you the email address again at the end and that way you can uh, um, get a hold of us. Now the one thing I want to say is we do put this video on YouTube so you can refer back to it um, and get some of the information that we have. Alrighty. So why choose Olander for your patch microsphere threaded fasteners? Well, our inventory, we have over $8 million worth of inventory in our three different locations. Now, all of this is not patched and microsphere product, but we have uh, hundreds of in-stock SKUs that already have a microsphere or a nylon patch, whether it's a heavy patch, a light patch, or a standard patch many different um, fasteners we have in stock. And, and then going back again to Philip Olander's idea of you have to have parts in stock in order to sell them. And, and that's what Olander does. When you become a Olander customer, you're part of our family. And we treat our family the way we want to be treated. We make sure that there's no surprises. Uh, engineering design support. Well, we've talked about that throughout this presentation today. Uh, let us help you with your application. Um, we, we, as I stated, we started business in 1962. We are a family business, uh, third generation. Um, we want to make sure that we're answering your questions. So we'll be sure to get back to you on that. 
uh, solutions, I, I put down the product lines, um, not, not one in particular, but we have a lot of um, proprietary fasteners. Uh, so if it's a helicoil product, we're the largest stocking helicoil distributor in the United States. You can't get helicoil from everybody. Uh, AVK uh, threaded inserts, um, captive fastener, press in nuts. So if you'll visit our website at olander.com, you'll see many of the different manufacturers that are proprietary lines that we represent and we stock and we help engineer in the parts. But don't forget, we also carry screwdrivers, Allen wrenches and standard uh, fastening installation tooling. Last thing we put down here was documentation and more. You are the customer. And you know this can be said on every one of our webinars. Um, the documentation you need, you, you need a CFC, you need a chem and phys test reports, um, certificate of conformance. Every one of these are available. All you need to do is ask us for those. What you want as a customer is what we want to deliver to you. Um, there's many places out there that do not give any documentation on fasteners. Well, we want to be your value uh, in your application. So make sure you reach out to us and we'll be able to help you with that. So um, let's go back. I have some more Q&A here. Let's go into here. And Doug, so can these solutions be used to ensure the water tightness of a thread? answer that? Well, I would have to look in to get absolute proof, but I would say based on how they function, uh, there's a particular types that are expanding thread lockers. Uh, I think they would be very effective in sealing out uh, water or, or liquids or whatever. Uh, they do seal corrosion, so if, they, if the air can't get in there uh, and then the water can't get out, so on, on that basis, I would say yes, but I would have to get you some more information. Yeah, it depends upon the pressure that we're looking at, but, but they do have the sealed um, uh, microspheres that also uh, will help keep liquids out, okay? So it's uh, 360 degrees, so we're, we're forming a seal on that part as well. And we also have fasteners that have um, like an O-ring underneath the head um, that is uh, a way of sealing out. We have uh, threaded inserts that have a seal underneath the head and are closed ends to stop any water from penetrating an application, especially in an electrical application. You don't want to uh, have any moisture getting in, in there. Um, next one here says, can you, can, uh, how, can order, how can we order these? Is this a special way that OLAN differenti differentiates the part numbers? What's the cost impact? Well, Doug, you talked about that at the beginning. Cost, really, it's, it's what's the cost of it coming apart, you know, your application. But when we look at higher quantities, that's where your cost goes down. Yeah, okay? absolutely. Yeah, if you're, doing, if you're doing a high enough quantity, I mean, you can, because if you're talking a traditional patch, a nylon 6.6 six patch, and you're not worried about shelf life, you can go ahead and, and of course, patch a, a, a large amount of screws, and, and the larger the amount, the cheaper the price gets. Uh, obviously, they have to amortize setup time and all of that. So that kind of depends on your volume, I would say. Yeah, and how do we order these? So... If you reach out to us at rfq at olander.com, we can make sure that the proper branch um, responds to your uh, request for quote. Part numbering systems are a little bit different. Most of them just end with a P on the end of our patch um, or, or end of our part number. But we also um, have the different designations for the different types of microspheres. So um, our part number would end with that microsphere part number. But you know, we, we make it very easy to um, allow you to buy from us. So um, the, our typical orders are just a $5 min with a $20 order. Um, if you're overseas, um, depending upon the account, it'd be a $100 minimum order or $300 minimum order, depending upon um, your account um, and, and how accounting has that set up. But you can reach out to us and uh, we, we can help you with that. So let's see, we got some more chat here. Thank you everyone for, for uh, engaging with us here. 
Uh, please enter your questions. Okay, we did that. All right. So we're good to go. Um, some of the things I want to talk about is how you contact us. At, uh, our website is olander.com. We do have e-commerce coming anytime now. We are at the end of the first quarter, and that's when we thought we would have everything going. But, you know, like anything, we're not going to present any fastener or any solution like e-commerce without making sure that it's ready for you and that it's right and it's working properly. You can also reach out for us for this presentation and other presentations that we've made before at YouTube. And that is our uh, YouTube um, address where you'll find all of our Olander links. And also you can reach out to us at uh, LinkedIn at, at the Olander company. And also the easiest email to remember is rfq at olander.com. And then we can answer all of your questions. So please, you know, those of you who put in a chat and you'd like a, a further follow up on that, we'd love to contact you. Please be sure to email us with um, your question and uh, we can get back to you specifically for that uh, particular question itself. So Doug, I wanna thank you for joining me today. Anything else that uh, you feel relevant that I may have missed? I just. Everybody send in your fasteners for a patch. <laughs> <laughs> RFQ at Olander. Thank well, you thank so you. much, John. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and thank you all for joining us today. We do appreciate it. We have many of you joining us today. Um, and, and without you, we, we don't have a business. So thank you very much and enjoy your day.